Welcome back to the Irish Hematology Oncology Podcast. I'm your host, Owen Tab, a pharmacist here at University Hospital Waterford. And this episode is going to come out a little later. I had this show recorded, or this episode recorded. Um, listened back to it, and I just wasn't happy. So I decided, well, scrap that script and rewrite the thing. So anyway, we're going to dive deep today into a topic that's crucial for anyone involved in cancer care, and that's that emergency event that can occur, chemotherapy extravasation. Now, if you're new to the field or just need a little refresher, extravasation is essentially when chemotherapy medication leaks out of the vein and into the surrounding tissue. It's a bit like a burst pipe, but instead of water flowing smoothly through the pipes, it starts seeping into the walls and causing damage. In the case of chemotherapy, this can lead to serious complications for patients, from pain and inflammation to tissue necrosis. That's why it's so important that we understand how to prevent extravasation and manage it effectively if it does occur. So let's get started and explore the ins and outs of chemotherapy extravasation. So in the realm of cancer treatment, chemotherapy is a powerful weapon, but it's not without its risks. One such risk, though relatively infrequent, is chemotherapy extravasation. Imagine the network of blood vessels in our body as a complex plumbing system, carrying the vital chemotherapy drugs to their intended targets, those cancer cells. Well, extravasation occurs when there's a breach in this system, causing the chemotherapy drugs to leak out of the blood vessel and into the surrounding tissues. It's akin to that leaky pipe, where the fluid, instead of flowing smoothly through it, seeps into the walls and causes damage. The severity of this leak isn't uniform. It's heavily influenced by the nature of the chemotherapy drug itself. Not all chemotherapy drugs are created equal when it comes to their potential for causing harm if they escape that intended pathway. The NCCP, the National Cancer Control Programme in Ireland, they classify these drugs into four categories based on their extravasation potential. So you have vesicans, which are further broken in, down into DNA binding and non-DNA binding. These are the heavy hitters of the chemotherapy world. Even a tiny amount of leaking out can trigger significant tissue damage, sometimes leading to necrosis or tissue death. The DNA, DNA binding vesicans, like anthracycline, so doxorubicin, dolomorubicin, idorubicin, work by interfering with the DNA of cells leading to their demise. The non-DNA binding ones, such as the veil Finca alkaloids, so vincristine, venerelbine, vinblastine, and the taxanes, patitaxel, docetaxel, cabazitaxel, disrupt other crucial cellular processes, ultimately causing cell death. Then you have irritants. So these guys occupy the middle ground. These drugs can cause inflammation, pain, and discomfort if they extravasate, but the damage is generally less severe than that caused by vesicans. They're like a persistent drizzle, unpleasant, but not as destructive. And then you have neutrals or non vesicans So these are the mildest in terms of extravasation risk. If they leak, they might cause a minimal amount of irritation akin to a light sprinkle of rain. So let's look at pinpointing the exact frequency of extravasation. And doing that is challenging due to a lack of a centralized reporting system. However, estimates from various studies suggest it occurs in anywhere from 0.01% to 7% of chemotherapy administrations. While these numbers might seem small, consider a bustling oncology ward where hundreds of chemotherapy infusions are given each week. Even at the lower end of the estimate, this translates to several patients experiencing extravasation. And remember, even one instance is one too many, as each carries the potential for pain, tissue damage, and disruption to a patient's treatment plan. Several factors can elevate the risk of extravasation. It's like having a plumbing system with weak points or operating it under challenging conditions. The patient-related factors are age, the health and accessibility of their veins, and the presence of other medical conditions that might affect circulation or tissue health. And then you look at the type of chemotherapy drug. Its concentration and the volume being administered also play a role. Infusion-related factors such as the flow pressure and the duration of the infusion can also influence the risk. Finally, device-related factors including the type and size of the cannula, the insertion site and the securement of the IV line are crucial considerations. 
Understanding these risk factors is allowed identifying potential cracks in that plumbing system. It allows healthcare professionals to take proactive steps to reinforce those areas and minimizes the chances of a leak. For instance, patients with fragile veins might benefit from a central venous access device for a CVAD, which is a more durable and secure IV line placed in a larger vein. Similarly, using flexible cannulas for vesicant drugs can reduce the risk of vein puncture and subsequent leakage. In essence, chemotherapy exercisation, while a relatively rare complication, is a serious one with potential for significant patient harm. Understanding its nature, the varying risks associated with different drugs, and the factors that can increase its likelihood is the foundation for effective prevention and management strategies. It's about recognizing the potential leaks in the system and taking proactive steps to ensure the safe and effective delivery of these life-saving medications. So in the realm of cancer care, preventing chemotherapy exercisation isn't just a good practice, it's an absolute necessity. The silver lining is that the majority of extravasation cases can be averted through meticulous, standardized administration techniques and comprehensive staff training. It's akin to driving, adhering to the rules of the road and maintaining vigilance drastically reduces the likelihood of accidents. The ESMO, so European Society of Medical Oncologists, and EONS, so the European Oncology Nursing Society guidelines, and they did a joint um, guideline, the gold standard in oncology care, and that provides a clear roadmap for this preventative journey. So the first step on this roadmap is selecting the optimal IV insertion site. The ideal scenario involves utilizing large, healthy veins with a preference for those located in the forearm. It's crucial to steer clear of areas overlying joints or those prone to vein dislodgement, as these sites are more susceptible to complications. In cases where a patient presents with challenging veins, or is scheduled to receive a particularly high-risk medication, we might consider employing a central venous access device, or a CVAD. Think of a CVAD as a more durable IV line strategically placed within a larger vein, offering a safer route for administering potent medications. The choice of cannula also holds significant weight in preventing exterization. It's about selecting the right tool for the task at hand, Employing a rigid needle for a vesicant drug goes with a high potential for tissue damage is ill-advised as it increases the risk of vein puncture. The preferred approach is to utilize flexible cannulas that can adapt to the vein's movements, minimizing the chance of complications. Beyond site selection and cannula choice, the actual administration procedures are equally vital. It's imperative to consistently verify blood return prior to administering any medication and to maintain a watchful eye on the IV site throughout the infusion process. Should any signs of swelling, redness or pain emerge, the infusion must be halted immediately and a thorough assessment of the situation conducted. The guidelines also highlight some additional preventative measures, so flushing. So if you flush the IV line with saline between different drug infusions, that's recommended to prevent drug interactions and that, to ensure that that line is clear. Also securement, so proper dressing and cannula fixation are essential to prevent accidental dislodgement of that cannula. And Patient education, so informing patients about the signs and symptoms of exorcisation empowers them to report any concerns properly. In essence, preventing chemotherapy exorcisation is a multifaceted endeavor that demands attention to detail, adherence to best practices, and effective communication among healthcare professionals. By prioritizing these preventative measures, we can significantly enhance patient safety and minimize the risk of complications associated with this potentially devastating event. But even with those most stringent preventative measures in place, the unfortunate reality is that extravasation can still occur. That's why the ability to properly recognize its signs and symptoms is of paramount importance. Think of it like a fire alarm. The quicker you detect the alarm, the faster you can react and mitigate the damage. So what should patients watch out for? Well, the initial signs of extravasation can be subtle, but patients should be educated to pay close attention to any unusual sensations or changes at the IV site. The most common early symptoms include tingling or burning, 
a feeling of pins and needles or burning sensation at or around the IV site can be an early indicator of extravasation and um, discomfort or pain. Any new or increasing pain or discomfort in the area should be reported immediately. Swelling. Swelling or tightness around the IV site can signal fluid leakage into the surrounding tissues and redness or inflammation. The skin around the IV site might become red or inflamed due to the irritating effects of the chemotherapy drugs. If these signs then are left untreated, those initial symptoms can progress to even more severe complications, such as blistering. So the formation of blisters indicates more significant tissue damage. Tissue necrosis, in severe cases, the leak medication can cause tissue necrosis, or tissue death is another word for it, leading to open sores or ulcers. And then that ulceration, so that the development of ulcers can be a long-term complication of extravasation, requiring extensive wound care and potentially even surgery. So what about the healthcare professionals? Well, those healthcare professionals, particularly those administering chemotherapy, need to be equally vigilant in recognizing potential extravasation. There are several red flags to watch out for during the infusion process. So firstly, resistance during the injection. If you encounter any resistance when injecting the medication, it could indicate that the IV cannula is no longer properly positioned within the vein. If a slow or stop infusion occurs, so if the infusion rate slows down or stops unexpectedly, it could be a sign that the medication is leaking into the surrounding tissue. And then patient discomfort. Always listen to your patients. If they report any unusual sensations or discomfort at the IV site, take their concerns seriously and investigate further. Remember, in the context of extravasation, time is truly of the essence. The earlier we identify the issue, the sooner we can initiate treatment and hopefully prevent long-term complications. It's about being proactive, not reactive. By staying alert and responding properly to any warning signs, we can significantly improve patient outcomes and ensure the safest possible chemotherapy administration. So what about the extravasation kit? That's a lifeline in emergencies. Well, the NCCP guidelines stress the importance of having an easily accessible extravasation kit in all areas where intravenous chemotherapy is administered. This kit acts as a first response tool in the unfortunate event of extravasation, enabling healthcare professionals to react swiftly and effectively. The specific contents of the kit might vary slightly between institutions, but the NCCP document provides a suggested list of essential items, and that includes Antidotes, so the specific antidote stock will depend on the types of chemotherapy drug used in the facility. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the episode. Some of the consumables then in order to administer, so syringes, needles, saline, water for injection, they're all crucial for administering antidotes or performing aspiration. Um, we have other equipment then, so you might need um, cold or hot packs for um, compresses, uh, dressings, tape, and a marker to outline the affected area. And symptom control, so medications for pain relief and managing allergic reactions might also be included. The availability of a well-stocked and regularly checked extravasation kit is not just a matter of preparedness, it's a testament to a healthcare facility's commitment to patient safety and optimal care in the face of potential complications. So now let's look what happens in the unfortunate event of extravasation. So now let's step on to how we look at managing if an extravasation does occur. So in that unfortunate event, the immediate actions are crucial. The first and most critical step, as emphasized by the NCCP guidance and all international guidance, is to stop the infusion immediately. It's like turning off the tap when you see the sink overflowing. You've got to cut off the source before you can deal with the mess. The prompt cessation of the infusion prevents further leakage of chemotherapy drug into the surrounding tissues, thereby limiting the potential damage. The subsequent management approach is not a one-size-fits-all. It's tailored to the specific situation, taking into account the type of drug involved and the severity of the extravasation. The NCCP guidelines drawing on from the ESMO recommendations outline the systematic approach that involves both general and specific measures. Think of these measures as the first aid you'd administer to a strained ankle. The goal is to minimize swelling and inflammation, giving the tissue the best chance to recover. 
These steps are outlined in Appendix 4 of that NCCD document, but you can also find them in the ESMO guidelines as well. So firstly, stop and disconnect the infusion. The first and most crucial step is to halt the flow of medication, preventing further leakage, inform the patient of the situation, and leave the needle or cannula in place for a potential aspiration. Secondly, identify the extravasated agent. Knowing the specific drug involved is crucial for determining the appropriate management strategy. Thirdly, aspirate the leaked medication. Attempt to withdraw as much of the leak solution as possible through the cannula. Avoid applying manual pressure over the area as this could worsen tissue damage. Once the aspiration is complete, remove the cannula. Fourthly, mark the affected area. Use a pen to outline the extent of the extravasation. This helps to monitor any changes in size or appearance. Now, notify the physician or the doctor. Inform the treating physician immediately. They will guide further management, including the potential use of antidotes or other interventions. Step six, implement specific measures. The subsequent steps depend on the type of drug involved. So for v or irritant drugs, um, localize and neutralize. So for DNA binding v apply cold compresses to the affected area to constrict blood vessels and limit the spread of the medication. Specific antidotes such as dextrosoxane for anthracycines might also be used. For non-DNA binding v the goal is to disperse and dilute. So apply a warm compress here to promote blood flow and disperse the medication Hyaluronidase, which is an enzyme that breaks down hyaluronic acid tissues, might be used to facilitate drug diffusion. For non vesicant drugs, monitor the site closely for any signs of complications. So those non vesicants are your neutral agents. So let me just go back into that role of compresses again, the hot versus cold. The application of compresses, either hot or cold, plays a crucial role in extravasation management. The choice between the two depends on the type of drug involved. So Cold compresses. These are typically used for DNA binding v drugs and some irritants. The cold temperature causes vasoconstriction, narrows the blood vessels, and limits the spread of the leaked medication. It also helps to reduce inflammation and pain. Then you have warm compresses. So these are recommended for non DNA binding v drugs and certain irritants. The warmth promotes vasodilation, widening the blood vessels, and encouraging dispersion and absorption of the leaked medication. Now we'll look at a couple of those antidotes. So antidotes are specific medications used to counteract the toxic effects of certain chemotherapy drugs. They act as targeted defense mechanism, neutralizing the threat and minimizing tissue damage. Okay, and now I'm going to give you a couple of examples of antidotes. So antidotes are those specific medications that are used to counteract the toxic effects of certain chemotherapy drugs when they extravasate. They act as a targeted defense mechanism, neutralizing the threat and minimizing tissue damage. So some examples include um, dexrosoxane, so that's used for anthracycline extravasation. It works by binding to iron and preventing the formation of harmful free radicals. Then you have hyaluronidase, so this enzyme helps to break down hyaluronic acid in tissues, facilitating the diffusion and absorption of leaked vinca alkaloids and taxanes. And then you have DMSO, or dimethyl sulfoxide. So this solvent can be used topically for extravasation of certain drugs like mitomycin C and anthracycines. And it enhances drug penetration and reduces tissue damage. So the availability and use of specific antidotes will depend on your own institution or hospital's policies. Okay, so now we're going to look at that unique challenge of a CVAD extravasation. So the majority of chemotherapy infusions are administered through peripheral IV lines. Those temporary lifelines typically placed in the arm or hand. However, for patients requiring long-term or frequent chemotherapy, a central venous access device, CVAD, might be the preferred route. So these devices are often inserted into larger veins in the chest or neck offer a more durable and secure access point for delivering medications. But what happens when the unthinkable occurs and the chemotherapy drugs leak from a CVAD? Well, extravasation from a CVAD, while thankfully less frequent than its peripheral counterpart, presents a unique set of challenges. The leak medication, instead of being confined to a localized area like an arm or hand, can spread into the chest cavity or the surrounding tissues. 
This can lead to serious complications like mediastinitis, which is an inflammation of the chest cavity, or pleuritis, an inflammation of the lining of the lungs. It's akin to having a leak in your basement. It's not always immediately obvious. It can be trickier to access and repair, and the damage has the potential to spread more extensively. So to detect a CVAT exorbitization can be challenging, as the signs and symptoms might be subtle or masked by other conditions. Patients might experience pain in the shoulder, neck, or chest wall, swelling around the catheter site, or even notice leakage from the catheter exit site. However, these signs aren't always present or might be attributed to other causes. That's why maintaining a high index of suspicion and properly investigating any unusual patient complaints or observations related to the CVAT site are crucial. So unlike peripheral exorization, where the leakage is often invisible or palpable, diagnosing CVAT exorization often requires imaging tests. So you might need a chest x-ray or more commonly a CT scan that can help pinpoint the location and the extent of the leak. These imaging studies provide valuable information to guide the subsequent management strategy. So let's look at that management strategy, Steve. So once a CVAT extraversation is confirmed, the management approach is multifaceted, often requiring a coordinated effort from the multidisciplinary team. The NCCP guidelines, again, going from those ESNO recommendations, outline a stepwise approach. So one, stop the infusion. As with any extraversation, the first step is to immediately stop the infusion to prevent further leakage. Two, aspirate the leak medication. Attempt to withdraw as much of the leak drug as possible through the CVAD itself. This helps to minimize the volume of medication in the surrounding tissues. Um, if available, administer antidotes. So for certain drugs, specific antidotes may be available to counteract their toxic effects as they're found above. Prompt administration of these antidotes can significantly reduce tissue damage. Step four, initiate supportive care. This might include administering antibiotics to prevent infection, pain medications to manage discomfort, and other support measures as needed. Five, consider a surgical intervention. So in some cases, surgical drainage might be necessary to remove the accumulated fluid and facilitate healing. The specific surgical approach will depend on the location and the extent of the extravasation. And step six, monitor and follow up. So close monitoring of the patient's condition is essential with regular assessments and imaging studies to track the resolution of the extravasation and identify any potential complications. So let's kind of highlight the importance of the teamwork in managing the CBAD. It's a complex and it demands a coordinated effort from the MDT. So this team might include the oncologist or hematologist, so overseeing the overall treatment plan and making decisions about further chemotherapy administration. Then you have the nurse. So they're the ones who are providing that direct patient care, monitoring the CVAT site, and they're the first guys on the scene to administer those medications and stop the infusion in the case of an extravasation. Then you have the pharmacist. So they're ensuring the safe and effective use of the medications, including the athletes, making sure that extravasation kit is well stopped. And they're also probably the best record as well of any um, details regarding the the medications that have been administered to the patient. Then you have the radiologist, so interpreting the imaging studies and guiding the placement of drainage catheters if needed, and the surgeon, so they're performing any necessary surgical interventions. Each member of the team brings their own unique skills and knowledge to the table and working collaboratively to achieve the best possible outcome for the patient following an extravasation. So now we're looking at follow-up and documentation. So the immediate management of an extravasation event is undoubtedly crucial, but the journey to recovery doesn't end there. The NCCP guidelines emphasize the importance of comprehensive follow and meticulous documentation, both of which play a pivotal role in ensuring the best possible outcome for the patient. So once that initial crisis of the extravasation has been addressed, the patient's journey towards healing then begins. This phase necessitates close monitoring and consistent follow-up to track their progress and promptly address any complications that might arise. The frequency and duration of follow-up will depend on several factors, including the severity of the extravasation, the specific drug involved, and the individual patient's response to treatment. In the initial days following the incident, patients typically require frequent assessments, often daily or every second day. These visits allow healthcare professionals to evaluate the affected area, monitor for signs of infection or further tissue damage, and adjust the treatment plan as needed. 
as the patient heals, the follow-up visits can become less frequent, but ongoing vigilance is crucial to ensure complete recovery. Patient education is another cornerstone of effective follow-up care. It's about equipping the patients with the knowledge and tools that they need to navigate their recovery journey. So this includes explaining the healing process to them, providing patients with a clear understanding of what to expect in terms of wound healing, potential scarring, and any functional limitations. Also highlighting potential complications. So educating patients about possible complications such as infection or delayed wound healing and instructing them on when to seek medical attention. Also, you can provide them with some self-care instructions, offer guidance on wound care, pain management, and any activities restrictions that might be necessary, and also encourage them to be openly communicative. So creating an environment where patients feel comfortable asking questions and expressing any current concerns that they might have. Identifying those problems quicker will improve their healing journey. Now let's go on to documentation. So meticulous documentation is an indispensable aspect of extravasation management. Every detail surrounding the incident needs to be recorded accurately and comprehensively. This includes the date and time of the extravasation, so establishing a clear timeline of events, the drug involved, so identifying the specific medication that extravasated, its concentration and the volume that was administered so far, the observed signs and symptoms, so documenting the patient's initial presentation and any subsequent changes. Um, any specifics around the IV access, noting, noting the type of device used, its location, and any relevant details about its insertion or maintenance. Um, then you have to document the steps that were taken to manage the situation, so recording any interventions that were implemented, including aspiration, antidote administration, and any surgical procedures. And then also document the follow-up assessments and the patient's progress. Document the patient's response to treatment and any complications that have been encountered. So why do we do this? This documentation serves multiple purposes. purposes. So firstly, it's a medical record. It provides a comprehensive account of the incident and its management, facilitating continuity of care if the patient is transferred to another hospital or seen by a different healthcare professional. It also acts as a decision-making tool, so it helps to inform decisions about ongoing treatment and follow-up care. For quality improvement, it allows for a retrospective analysis and identification of potential areas for improvement in extravasation prevention and management. Is there anything that we can implement in order to prevent something like this happening in the future? And as a legal protection, so in the unfortunate event of um, litigation, accurate and complete documentation can serve as crucial evidence. All healthcare professionals involved in patient care have a responsibility to contribute to this documentation progress. Okay, so for healthcare professionals working in cancer care, I'd strongly recommend you to delve deeper into the ESMO Eons Clinical Practice Guidelines on Extravasation Management and that NCCP Extravasation policy template as well. So these guidelines, they're based on the latest evidence and expert consensus. They provide invaluable guidance for optimizing patient care and minimizing the risks associated with extravasation. They also help you with identify antidote and compresses for inclusion in your own local extravasation kit and policy, because that's something that you'll have to do yourself. And that brings us to the end of today's episode. I hope you found this discussion on chemotherapy exercisation informative and helpful. As always, if you're a pharmacist, remember to avail of the CPD document to record your IIOP CPD. It's a very handy document. Um, if you have any questions or comments or you'd like to suggest topics for future episodes, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can contact me via Spotify comments. They're available now. Um, my Instagram account, so at Irish or my email address, irishteamonkpodcast at gmail.com. I really value your feedback and it really helps to build the episodes going forward. To the Irish, thank you for listening to the Irish Hematology Oncology Podcast. Until next time, thanks a million. And I'll end again as I do always with this important disclaimer. This podcast is for educational purposes only. Remember, the field of cancer care is always advancing and new research may lead to changes in treatment approaches or protocols. Always consult with your own team for personalized guidance and discuss any information from this podcast with them. Seek information from trusted local and national resources for the most up-to-date recommendations.
Okay, can't see you guys.